could take a lot of the you know, hope out of us. In the first days of the crisis, one of the men running BP's response had little inkling what battles lay ahead. In your mind, you're thinking this may be a few days, maybe even a few weeks. Um, uh, we didn't actually believe it would, it would take that long. Until the accident, it seemed the oil men had tamed the harsh environment in which the deep water horizon was drilling. The deep water creates some really unique challenges. Not the least of which is, is uh, you can't physically go down and touch anything. Everything you do in deep water is remote. And, uh, and it's done with sensing of one kind or another. It's a very, very technically intense industry. But there had never been a blowout a mile below the waves. It would prove to be a technological challenge beyond any faced before. The rig Doug is visiting today was brought here after the accident. The wreckage of the deep water horizon lies a mile below his feet. The day after the rig sank, BP sent down a remote operated vehicle fitted with cameras to investigate the well. When the 68,000 ton rig hit the seabed, it caused a storm of silt. The ROV began its mission at the wellhead. And of course, we don't see anything above the block. Remember, we don't see the riser, and nor do we see uh, oil or gas coming out. BP believed they had made a momentous discovery. And of course, at that point, we thought the flow had stopped. We thought this horrible accident maybe is coming to an end. BP believed the blowout preventer had fired as the rig sank but the real discovery was yet to be made. We, we started then circling the block preventer with the ROV, and that's when we discovered the riser was still attached, but bent over at 90 degrees. So then we weren't certain anymore. Maybe, maybe it, it could be fun. The ROV then flew along the riser pipe, 5,000 feet. When it fell on the seabed, the riser had created a trench. The sonar picked up something away to the right. Go over there. There's a piece of drill pipe sticking out of the mud with oil coming out. Not a large amount of oil, but oil coming out. And that was our very first indication. We still have, uh, we, we may still have uh, a blowout current. The riser was bent over like a roller coaster. It traveled 1,500 feet up in the water and then turned back on itself, pointing towards the well. Sonar led engineers to another site on the left of the riser. Here we see what looks to be a broken end of the riser, but now it looks like much more oil is coming out. And that's when we found our two leads. Now we realize the well is still flowing. And the enormity of the technical challenge exploded. To make matters worse, the company's hopes of a quick fix were dying. In the crisis center in Houston, Engineers had been trying to remotely activate the blowout preventer. Nothing was working. Out of options, an explosive charge was detonated inside the BOP. The BOP rocked a little bit. That tells me that it did fire. And when that didn't seal it off, well, we, have a, we have a really big problem here, really significant problem. What were you thinking at that point? Oh, this is going to be bad. Fear began stalking the Gulf Coast. The region is one of America's richest fisheries. As oil began to threaten livelihoods and the coastline, despair loomed large and the American government began turning the screw on BP. Our job is basically to keep the boot on the neck of British Petroleum 
to carry out the responsibilities that they have both under the law and contractually to move forward and to stop this spill. Now the stakes could not be higher for BP. There were times when it felt like the world didn't trust us. It, there were times when it felt like that uh, people doubted our motive. One of the biggest questions now was how much oil was flowing from the blown out well. We're joined now by Doug Suttle, the Chief Operating Officer for Exploration and Production for BP. On day eight of the crisis, Doug Suttles appeared on television. He put a figure on the size of the oil leak. Well, we can say, based on what we're picking up on the surface, it looks like something between one and 5,000 barrels a day is a reasonable estimate. But President Obama's point man on the spill knew it was far worse. I have to tell you, what was going through my mind at the time had nothing to do with one or 5,000. I was so far beyond that on what the potential implications of the spill were. Admiral Thad Allen was a key figure in this crisis. He'd been brought in by the president to make sure BP lived up to their responsibilities. He dismissed the figure of 5,000 barrels of oil leaking per day. I knew it was far more than that. We were trying to bring as many resources to the scene as we could. And while all of that was interesting to me, it wasn't consequential in my decision making. The inaccurate figures had come from a government agency. These were coming from well-intentioned people that thought they understood what was going on or trying to answer questions from the press. You know, it's really interesting. If you don't have a number, that's a problem. If you have a number, that's a problem. Charlie Henry had a problem of his own. Part of his job was to predict where the oil might go. A job made far harder because the oil was flowing from a well a mile below the surface of the ocean. Part of the consequence from the way the oil was released was that the oil was not at the surface as a very small point source of pollution. It was widely scattered. How do you then respond to an oil slick that is initially very large? Uh, and it was very large just because of, as those droplets drift to the surface, they continue to spread. There was no single spill to target with skimming vessels and boom. Instead, the weather and ocean currents were driving patches of oil across a front line of hundreds of miles of marshes and beaches. It equated more to trying to hold a line. You didn't know where the skirmishes were going to be and where the attack was going to come from, and therefore you had to defend the entire line. That put a tremendous resource a requirement on us in terms of boom, skimming equipment, and people, and that made it more like a war. BP was said to be spending six million dollars a day on efforts to clean up the spill. In the year before the explosion, the company's profits were nearly 14 billion dollars. As BP's nightmare deepened, the company's leaders hoped its vast wealth could now save it. You know, very early on uh, in the event, a uh, conversation I had with our CEO, Tony Hayward, um, he told me I had every resource of the group available to me, money, people, anything I needed. There were literally no limits to their response. No limits to the amount of money? No. But all the world's riches might not be enough. This was fast becoming the well from hell. Pat Campbell was now BP's key well control advisor. In 40 years battling blowouts, he had never faced anything like this. 20 years ago, he was in Kuwait, fighting 800 oil wells deliberately set on fire as the first Gulf War ended. The work that had to be done to take care of them was about 1,000% easier than the BP well, one well. They put out just as much oil and gas. Difference was they were on the surface. Difference with this one is 5,000 feet down. 